This is Tom Repass of Canyon Rim Honeybees in the Black Hills of Western South Dakota. This is the next presentation in our series of presentations about rearing queen bees and breeding honeybees, the mating yard and beyond. Congratulations! You've raised some ripe queen cells. Now what? In this presentation, I'm going to review and discuss everything that happens after you have raised queen cells. How to care for them, transport them, mating nukes, and then caging and shipping of queens, banking queens, a topic that is often uh, overlooked or ignored, our other half of our genetics, the drones, and then some of the issues with queen rearing and breeding, troubleshooting, and some possible solutions you might consider. Okay, well now you have raised some uh, queen cells. Uh, how do you care for them and transport them uh, before they emerge? Queen cells are very delicate. They're vulnerable to damage if you handle them too roughly or too early. Before the queen cells are capped, you really should try not to move them unless you're moving them, say, from the cell starter or the cell finisher. And for the first few days while they're be developing after being capped, the pupa are very uh, delicate and even a, a little bit of a shake or a movement can damage them. So usually we wait until day nine post graft or later. You can move them earlier than that, anytime after they're capped. I mean, you could put them into a queen cell incubator. I know many queen beaters who do that. But if you do, you need to be extra careful and extra gentle. And that's why most of us wait before we start moving them around until a little bit later, unless we have some other reasons to, to move earlier. So when you're handling a, a queen cell, uh, you try to not jostle or shake them. Don't pinch or crush the sides. Try to handle at the base, especially those of us that use the uh, plastic queen cell cups. Those are, those are very sturdy, and if you just hold them, the queen cells by the base, you're going to be safe. And try to keep them vertical if you can. Um, there might be times when you might have them horizontal uh, as you're moving them around, but really try to avoid that if you can. Uh, r shortly before emergen emergence, they're much more, uh, much more sturdy, and they, they could be horizontal, but really try to avoid doing that. And if you're going to transport them any length of time, try to keep them at the temperature range of the brood nest, which is around 92 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Sometimes you need to remove the cells from the cell finisher before they emerge. Uh, many of us use a queen cell incubator. I try to set the temperature myself around 94 degrees and at least 50% humidity, if not slightly more. You don't want it to be too high. That can be problematic uh, as well. Now, if we're going to be traveling th to an out yard, you could simply put it in a cooler with a warm pack of water, and I, I make the water a little bit warmer than uh, the actual temperature that I might be aiming for because there's going to be some temperature loss as the uh, temperature is you know, going into the insulation of the cooler. Uh, the rest of us often have incubators that we can plug into our vehicle, you know, the cigarette light plug, uh, and we can travel around with our queen cells in, uh, in the incubator as we're going to out yards or if we have a mating yard that's some distance away. You can make them homemade. You can convert a, a chicken poultry incubator or reptile incubator, and there are some commercial incubators for sale as well. Uh, ideally, we try not to allow the virgins to emerge in the incubator. Uh, sometimes we have to do that. Maybe there's no mating nukes open or some of us may be uh, doing instrumental insemination. Even even with that though, it's better to have the, the virgins emerge in a uh, in a mating nuke, uh, you know, where the virgins are not allowed to fly, of course. Uh, but if you don't have any choice, uh, we sometimes will emerge them in an incubator. Uh, we put a, a cell into a queen cage with some food, honey or queen candy, and also a few nurse bees so that they can care for them. Even though the virgin queens can feed, if they don't have nurse bees caring for them, they'll begin dying, you know, within a few days, but sometimes even within a few hours, they'll begin weakening. So they should always have some nurse bees present. It could be as few as two or three of them. It doesn't have to be a whole big uh, bunch of them because, you know, the incubator is going to be warm enough. So the ripe queen cells are placed into the mating nukes uh, about a day before they're ready to emerge. It's really important to pay attention to your math. If you didn't, they may begin emerging before uh, before you put them in a mating nukes, and that's always a, 
a lot of fun trying to chase the Virgin Queens around the incubator or whatnot. Um, and if they emerge in your uh, cell finisher, well, you know, you might pull out your frame with your queen cells and find every single one of them destroyed except, you know, the one version that emerged. And that happens to me every now and then. Uh, maybe if you grafted a larva that was a bit older than it should have been, a larger larva than it should have been, that, that could also emerge a day earlier because it was a little bit further along in its development. So just pay attention to that. If the uh, weather is cold, I tend to put the cells uh, placed onto the face of a, a comb of capped brood because you know there's bees going to be clustering there. But later on in the summer when temperatures are warmer, you can just simply uh, put them between the top bars of the frames of, of the mating nuke or the full strength hive and the bees will keep them uh, warm. Many of us use uh, queen cell protectors and these are reusable. Uh, that helps uh, the queen cell from being damaged as you're handling and moving them. It also keeps uh, or, or deters, not, it doesn't necessarily keep completely, but tends to uh, deter the worker bees from uh, destroying that queen cell uh, because most of the time they don't destroy it from the tip but from the sides. Uh, thus, if you put them into a, uh, say, a, a nuke that might have still some open larva and some eggs, the bees might say, hey, I don't want this uh, queen cell. We're going to raise our own queens from our own... Uh, own eggs and larva and they'll just, just take down your queen cell so this helps uh, deter that from happening and you can make these I've seen old-time queen breeders make uh, them just from a little bit of tin foil wrapped gently around the queen cell so you, you don't have to buy the commercial ones if you don't want to okay let's talk about setting up mating nukes so you need to put the queen cells of course in a colony where they can emerge and be cared for for the bees. After that, she'll begin going on her mating flights about five to seven days later, uh, weather permitting. If the weather is cold or rainy, she might be delayed by a week or, or longer. Of course, the longer that she waits, the less likely she's going to be well mated, and the more likely she might be poorly mated or even not mated at all. And whenever so, whenever she mates, then egg laying begins about three days after mating. So keep that in mind when you're going back to the nukes to check to see if you have uh, a virgin queen that has now mated and is, is now beginning to lay eggs. There's several options available to place your ready to emerge queen cells. There's the mini mating nukes, the double mating nukes, queen castles, four or five frame nukes, or even you could put them in full size production colonies, for, for example, that might require, uh, you know, uh, requeening. The benefit of the mini mating nukes is they don't require a lot of bees, maybe a cup of bees or so, and and that's very valuable. So you're not, you know, bees are resources, and there's only so much to go around. And if you're making larger uh, colonies, you know, to make to, for your uh, virgins to mate in, that's you may only be able to have so many of them because you're going to be depleting the population of bees in your production colonies, and that could affect honey production and other things. The downside, though, of the mini mating nukes is it's really not a normal situation. Uh, you you know they're difficult to maintain long term. Uh, we don't have a problem with small hive beetles up here in the north, but down south, these really the small hive beetles will really decimate these mating nukes. And then of course there's drifting. Uh, they can abscond or swarm. You know sometimes all the bees will go to one mating nuke, little mini mating nuke, and, and abandon all the others. And there's really not enough time to evaluate the queen's brooding pattern if you decide to let her lay in there for very long, um, because you'll just it'll be plugged up, and then they'll end up wanting to swarm on you. There's double mating nukes. These are a little bit larger. Uh, they're not quite as difficult to maintain as the mini mating nukes. Uh, there are supers where you can put the comb into a full-size hive, and then have it be drawn out in this uh, this special super before putting into the uh, ma double mating nukes and they have the same kind of issues. The other issue I didn't man man mention with uh, these or with the mini mating nukes is if you set them on the ground uh, and you have skunks which you know most of us in North America do uh, they're gonna just roll them around. I, I, I've seen folks use a, a bungee cord to uh, you know bungee the top shut and then bungee to a full-size cinder block um, but that you know that costs money and so you can do it that way or you can you know, I've seen folks set them high up off the ground, such as on a little T post that was designed for this. Uh, but if you just set them on the ground without much weight, the skunks are just going to like roll them around. And you know, I've had that happen with with mine over time. Even the ones that I had bungee corded tight, they didn't get into them. But they, they just, and that's obviously not very good for your bees.
A lot of us use queen castles. Uh, they're specially built high with anywhere from two to four compartments and separate entrances for each. The advantage is, is you, you're using the same type of comb as in your production colonies. Uh, because there's more bees in them, they're easier to maintain, they're useful in cool conditions, and the dividers are removable, so you could convert a two comb mating nuke over to a four comb if you wanted to. The disadvantage is you need an extra piece of equipment. Uh, I do use these some of the time. Um, at the end of the season, I end up converting them, either uniting them back into full-size colonies, or sometimes I put them into a four or five frame nuke for overwintering. We do that as well. Uh, I do have a video on how to make this. Uh, there, it's pretty s straightforward if you have uh, reasonable carpentry uh, skills. But these are, and you can also buy them commercially, but you know, they, they do cost more money if you're making them or if you're buying them pre made. And then there's a standard five frame nuke. It's a very useful piece of equipment. A lot of us use these for making splits, or, or sometimes we end up, you know, we sell the extra uh, to new beekeepers as an additional source of income. Uh, they use standard size comb, and because they're larger, they're easier to maintain throughout the season. You can better evaluate the queen's brood pattern. And as I mentioned, you could either reunite them with other colonies or overwinter them, overwinter them for an increase for next year. Uh, so what I often do is, towards the very end of the year, the end of the summer, the last queens that I'm raising that I don't sell, I'll put them into a five-frame nuke, and then I'll use them, uh, overwinter them, and use them for increase or for replacement of any winter loss the following spring. And then there, finally, you can use queen cells to requeen full-size production colonies. Many commercial beekeepers do this. Uh, you don't need special equipment, and it's a way of requeening without having to have mating nukes or, or any of that to deal with. Uh, basically, usually we do this towards the end of the honey flow, and after you remove the old queen, you just place the ripe cells uh, between the frames, often uh, uh, in a honey super above uh, the brood nest, and the virgin queen will emerge, and if the colony decided to make any queen cells down below, she'll just come down there and take care of them herself. Uh, but, you know, you're not going to be mating a lot of queens by this method if you're planning on selling them to other beekeepers. Uh, in that situation, you have to have other option, you, you know, mating nukes specifically for a higher volume of queens. But it's a wonderful uh, method of requeening your production colonies if you're a, you know, sideliner or a commercial beekeeper. Mating nukes, setup and management. At the beginning of the year, you need to stock them with bees at least 24 hours before the queen cells are ready. Uh, I like to let them settle. You could do it sooner than that, but it, I like to let them settle down and realize that they're a colony. Uh, if you have entrances that can be closed, I usually do that. Uh, I, I try to have my mating yard in a different location than where I got the bees so that there's not much drifting back to home. Uh, the mini mating nukes, you, you use a cup of bees, whereas the queen castles or five frame nukes, you use one or two combs with a, a resource comb of pollen and honey and then some extra bees. And that's really important. I've seen newer queen breeders, newer beekeepers making uh, their splits poorly by just not putting enough bees in there and then some of the bees drifting back to the original colony. So that's one of the, the uh, area that you can make a mistake if you're not paying attention. There's a wonderful video uh, by the University of Guelph showing how to make mini nucleus colonies. And I, I strongly encourage you to look it up. It, they really explain it very well. And if you're planning on going this route for your mating nukes, it's a, I really recommend uh, watching that video. Sometimes you can have drifting. Uh, you know, they're queenless. They realize they're queenless. Ideally, you don't want to have open brood in, in your in your nukes because they may just reject your queen cell and just make their own, uh, their own queen cells instead. So one way to minimize drifting is to use this uh, pheromone in these little plastic, uh, uh, little plastic, uh, to, uh, little bits of plastic that you can hang or staple into the mating nuke and that makes the colony think there's a queen present and they're less likely to drift uh, to other nukes and you do this in the very beginning when you first make them up and I found them to be pretty successful and if I'm making uh, you know these are full size ones full would be a uh, for like a full single box colony or even a five frame nuke but if I'm making a queen castle where well, there's only two combs in there I might clip it and use half of one of these that I hang or staple into that. And 
you know, once that queen has emerged and she's mated, that you know, those those bees now realize this is our home. This is where we're going to be. Then then they're really not going to drift. And then you can remove them. And I've actually reused them, you know, maybe two times or even three times in a, in a single season. Uh, and they seem to still have some effect. So if you're making up a series of mating nukes, you know, in the spring, uh, not all of them at once, you could you can reuse these at least for a few weeks anyway. So one thing, you know, is try to c set your nukes out with entrances facing in different directions among trees or shrubs. Because if you just put them out in an open field, you know, in a line, that might be easier for you to walk down and, you know, check each one after the other. But the bees might get confused in trying to figure out where to go. And there's a lot of drifting with virgins often anyway coming back from their mating flights. And so you want to try to do as much as you can to, uh, to try to prevent that from happening. Um, these little small colonies with so few bees... It, it's really very hard for them to have enough resources from what they're able to forage their, on their own. So usually I do feed with a uh, syrup and protein supplement. And of course, if there's a big honey flow coming in and there's more bees, then they're going to be fine. But early on in the year and then later, you, often you will need to feed them. Uh, they can be robbed out too if you're not careful. So I try to put my mating yard away from my larger colonies. And that also helps because the larger colonies may be having drones that I want to mate with my virgin queens. So not having them right in the same place, but a, a little ways off also helps with that. Uh, w when you first make these up, you want to make sure that they're not making new queen cells. I mean, that's not in the end of the world. I mean, you can just let them nature take its course and then catch that queen and sell it. But it won't be a queen from whatever mother... Uh, you know, you'd grafted your queen cells from. And then also some of these, especially the mini mating nukes, the population can grow too much and, you know, they'll end up swarming. The, and, you know, these little tiny uh, swarms they'll cast, you know, obviously have no s chance of survival. But uh, that's not really helpful. So I try to, you know, check them. And when I'm catching queens, make sure the population isn't too high and, and, it, and the brood nest isn't being uh, plugged. And if necessary, you can shake out those bees, or, or for ma that matter, just start over with a, a brand new uh, nuke if you're using the mini mating nukes. Another website I cannot as strongly recommend as I str I, I strongly recommend that uh, you go to Randy Oliver with Scientific Beekeeping, and I have do not have enough words uh, to say how wonderful of a website this is. Uh, he has so much information there. And one thing that he uh, recommends is using oxalic acid dribble or, sublim or the sublimation or vaporization. If you make up a nuke with a ripe queen cell, there's going to be a window where there's no capped brood. Uh, and so you can treat between day 19 and 21 where the queen cell was pl from the where, when the queen cell was placed. That queen has now ideally emerged and she has mated and she's laying eggs, but none of the brood is yet capped. And so those mites have nowhere to hide. And so you can use an oxalic acid dribble, or myself, I, I end up using the vaporization with just a tiny bit of, uh, of oxalic acid, and it, it, giving it a shot that one time will, will deplete the mite population. And usually in a nuke, it, it won't be a, uh, there's not enough population of bees for those mites to really you know, cause any problems, uh, at least not till the very end of the year. Then at the end of the season, you know, you can take all the bees' brood comb and, you know, unite them back to weaker hives to strengthen them before winter. But I often will overwinter uh, either queen castles or five-frame nukes to try to overwinter them uh, and then use them as replacements or increase the following spring. Now up here in the north, it's not a, you know, high chance of wintering or success, succeeding wintering them all, but it's a gamble that's worth doing you know even if only half of them survive i mean those are colonies future colonies of bees that you might not have had had you not attempted that okay let's talk about caging and shipping of queens if you're going to be selling queens to other beekeepers or for that matter transporting queens from their mating nuke over to uh, another out yard you're going to have to be able to cage them so that you can you know transport them to a wherever they're going to go So in order to introduce a queen to our new colony or offer her for uh, sale, you need to put her in a cage with attendant workers as well as some queen candy. There's many types of queen cages, and I'm sure you all are all familiar with the different types. And many of us have our preferences. Uh, you know, it's sometimes it comes down to cost, what's most cost effective. Uh, you know, if you're especially if you're doing this as a you know commercially or a sideline business. 
if you're small time, you know, it doesn't matter so much. You know, you, you can reuse queen, so, queen cages maybe that you had gotten from some of the queens that you had purchased in the past. Queen candy is important. Uh, it gives food for the bees and queen while they're traveling. Uh, and also you can introduce queens through the, you know, opening the end and allowing the colony to eat through. And it gives them a few days to get to know the queen uh, before the, she is released. And you don't want it to be too soft because it'll melt onto the bees and then they'll die. Or it'll be so soft that the bees of the colony she's being introduced will eat through too quickly and, you know, within a day or so. And then they'll not have accepted the queen yet and then they'll end up killing her. There's many recipes. Uh, but one is corn syrup with powdered sugar mixed at a 1 to 3 ratio. And you just stir the powdered sugar into the syrup. Uh, you want it to be thick and firm, but not hard. And adding a few drops of glycerin helps uh, keep it soft. Uh, I usually make up a large batch at once, and then I store it in the, in the freezer, and I have it sealed so it doesn't dry out. And before I knead it, I'll pull it out, let it warm to room temperature, and I'll just put these into the queen cages right before it's kneaded. You can preload queen cages, but then you want to keep them from get drying out and getting rock hard. So I'll often uh, put them in an airtight plastic bag and store them in the refrigerator until I'm ready to use them. There's many ways to catch queens and cage them, so you need to be gentle to avoid injuring them you definitely don't want to pick her up by the abdomen a laying queen because you know you can damage her internal organs and her, her uh, ovarials and whatnot uh, so usually I just recommend you can pick them up by the thorax or, or by the wings I prefer the wings because I think it was I believe it was Mike Palmer said you know they're their little handles ready ready made for you to pick them up I see some beekeepers picking them up by the legs but I worry that you know you could damage your leg if she starts trying to fly off and you don't have a good grip or you're only holding on one leg so I pick, her, I pick up them up by the wings. And then you put her head first into the cage until she walks in on her own. Uh, and then you do the same thing with the nurse bees. And if you pick them up by the wings and put them in, you know, you, you won't get stung very often. Um, you occasionally will, but it's the tip of your fingers. It's not, not a big deal. I, I know a lot of new beekeepers, uh, you know, are a little intimidated about this. But th those bees that are feeding the larvae as you see right there those are nurse bees and so they're not angry aggressive foragers and most of the time they don't even hardly know what's happening if you do it quickly enough and with experience you get very fast uh, and usually five to seven attendants in a queen cage is enough and it's easier when they're not running around but when they're actually feeding uh, larvae and you know that you're picking up a nurse a young nurse bee at that point as well and here's just a little video of me picking some uh, there's the queen and uh I got her by the wings, and they are fast. You just put her head in there, and uh, oops, she almost got away. But notice how I kind of gently got her without really crushing the abdomen. Um, sometimes they fly off, too, so if you see her on the ground, you know, you can pick her up gently and put her in. And then I, I just put in some workers. I just pick them right off the comb and do that. And if you get really good, you can do this even faster, especially if you have an order for many queens coming in. shipping queens so myself even though i'm a queen bee breeder and I, I i raise them for sale i have enough of local business that i don't ship anymore i used to ship and i just had some bad experiences where you know they were lost or they were kept out in the cold or whatnot um the shorter the shipping time the better uh obviously label fragile live bees handle with care uh try not to ship them during very cold or very hot weather you know, you try to arrange so that they're not going to be left in a mailbox in a hot summer day, uh, you know, and, and get cooked. Uh, or have the customers arrange for them not to be dropped off, but to pick them up at, at the central depot or the post office instead of being delivered to the mailbox or their door. So one concern, of course, by shipping 
uh, queen bees is, you know, does, is there any problem with them? And they found, at least in this one study, that there was a higher rate of supersedure if the bees were sent, not, it didn't matter whether it was air mail or surface mail, much less for local queens. And this is something that you, if you decide to raise local queens as a, as a business, you can uh, promote that, you know, the lower risk of supersedure. And when I have customers coming to, to pick up their queens, you know, I'm, that queen might not have been out of that uh, mating nuke, you know, for more than an hour or so. Whereas some of the commercial queens that are shipped in, you know, you don't know how long they were out or even if they were in a queen bank for who knows how long. So when do you know that a queen is ready to be caught from her mating nuke and then transferred into her new hive or to be caged and, and shipped for sale? Some larger queen producers ship as soon as the first eggs are seen and you know maybe 14 days after the ripe queen cell was placed in the nuke. It makes sense. Time is money. You know, the longer that you wait, the less, you know, the l fewer numbers of queens you're going to be raised. But this does have an effect upon acceptance and supersedure rates. And as a small time queen breeder, you might decide to allow the queens to lay longer. And especially if you're raising them for your own personal use, you know, you're not under the, you know, you're not trying to worry about cash flow and, and volume of queens you're selling. You're, you maybe are worrying more about quality. And if you let them lay an extra week, at least three weeks rather than two weeks after placing the queen cell, the acceptance rates go up vastly. Uh, and this is looking at, you know, how many queens are kept, but then also, you know, the supersedure rate 15 weeks after introduction. And it gets even better if you let them lay for four weeks. This might be not be something viable for someone who's raising queens commercially because you might not be able to charge that much more for queens that have been l allowed to lay for twice as long in the mating nuke. You know, it just might not be a commercially viable thing. Um, but for someone who's a small queen breeder, you can promote this saying this is something that we do to try to improve the quality of our queens. And then for you yourself, you know, who's raising it, you know, you, that doesn't really matter whether you, you know how soon you catch unless you're desperate for a queen. But otherwise, you might allow them to lay in the mating nukes for longer just so that you know that you're going to have a higher quality queen and less likely to be superseded uh, sometime after she had been introduced. Queen bee banking. There may be times when you need to remove a queen from her mating nuke before she's ready to be introduced to her new colony or sold to customers. I have to be honest, I, I, I really don't like doing this because this does affect queen survival. It is not an ideal uh, situation to have multiple mature queens or for that matter even virgin queens that are sitting in a queen bank you know the the best place the, the is for a queen is to be running around on the comb laying eggs you know exactly as a queen is supposed to do uh, but sometimes you don't have a choice you know and this also goes if you received a big order of queens uh from a commercial you know queen producer and you want to put them in your production colonies but you can't get out to the yard or maybe you had a late spring blizzard or or whatever reason and you may have to bank these queens uh it's not ideal but sometimes it's something that's necessary banking involves caging the queen and putting her into a queenless queen bank along with other caged queens uh some queen breeders will bank their queens so they're ready for sale on short notice uh, you know, somebody says, hey, I need a queen today. Okay, sure, we'll ship it out. And they, they're they not necessarily running out to the mating nuke to go grab one. I mean, they just have them sitting there waiting and ready. Um, you know, the ones with large turnover, they're selling queens every day, so it's not a big deal. Uh, I also know some uh, queen producers sell queens that, or queen sellers, I should say, sell queens that they didn't actually produce, but they bought in volume and then they put in a queen bank. And so somebody calls them up. Oh, yeah, I need a queen. Can you have it? Sure, I have one right now. Come on. And they just pull it out of a queen bank. Um, and then, of, of course, if those of us that do uh, instrumental insemination, we, we may have to have them temporarily in a queen bank as well. Or to open up mating nukes, say you want to, instead of making a new mating nuke, you want to reuse the old one by putting a ripe queen cell in, but your customer has not gotten the queen yet, so you might have to put them into a queen bank while you're you know, opening up space in the mating nukes for the queens. 
But there are problems. You know, keeping mated queens together in the same hive is an unnatural situation. Very soon, within hours after banking, they decrease production of queen pheromone, they stop laying eggs, their ovaries shrink, and if you keep them in banks too long, especially if you keep them in wire cages like this, there's a strong chance that they're going to be damaged and the tips of their feet uh, will be damaged and shoot off. Uh, and such queens are much more likely to be rejected when being introduced. Not to say that it can't be done, but when you're introducing a banked queen into a new colony, you might have to take some more time and take more care so she's less likely to be rejected. And there's uh, some, uh, quite, a few, quite a bit of data regarding this and quite a bit of scientific studies, uh, but you know, th those uh, stored in a queen bank have a higher rate of being replaced. Even though they might be accepted, later on the bees decide, yeah, we don't want her, and they'll end up replacing her. So try not to bank them longer than two or three weeks. Ideally, any day is a day too long in a queen bank. Um, but sometimes you have to do what you have to do, and just keep in mind the the less, the, the shorter the time that you bank queens, the better. So how do you set up a queen bank? Basically, it's the same way as you would set up a a queenless cell builder. So lots and lots of nurse bees. You want them well fed, plenty of syrup, plenty of protein supplement. Make sure there's no queen cells on there and, and no open brood or eggs either that they can build queen cells because if they build just one queen cell, uh, they'll say, eh, we don't want these other queens, and they may allow all of them to die, and that obviously could be a huge loss of, of money, you know, depending on, on what, you know, how many queens are in this queen bank, and you don't want any free-running queens either, so I make sure there's a queen excluder on all entrances, because virgins are kind of sneaky, and, you know, they may be coming back from a mating flight and decide, yeah, I don't want to go back to this little teeny uh, mating nuke. I'm going to go into this big, nice, queenless colony right here, and I'll set up housekeeping. And once you've got a queen running around, and especially if she starts laying eggs, they're just going to ignore uh, any of the queens in the queen banks, or in the queen cells that are in your queen bank. And just you want lots of bees. I just cannot stress that enough, like so much that you can barely put the lid back on uh, because there's so many of them. If you think you're you, you're not sure you need uh, need more, then just put more in. It's better to be safe. Other tips to improve success: It's good to keep similar types of queens and ages of queens in each queen bank, because they might give prefer preferential treatment to some queens and others. You know, for example, if you have Russian queens and you have Italian queens, try to bank each of them in a separate queen bank. Um, if you have virgin queens versus mated queens, yeah, obviously those should be separated into a different queen bank. And then again, try to avoid the wire mesh cages if you can. Um, but if you do, try to have the ones that have the wire mesh with the wooden so the queen can get away from the bees that might be chewing or biting her feet. You know, and when you're introducing a banked queen into her new colony, you know, try to use a push-in cage so she can start laying, let her ovarials swell and begin laying and increase queen pheromone. Maybe even introduce her into a nuke first and then put her into a, the full-size colony that you intend her to go. This is a photo from a from a, a publication, as you can see below. And as you can see, the queens in the other queen cages are basically being ignored. You know, they they really like these queens down here, and they like this queen also. And if you see that in your queen bank, you better do something about it. Um, you know, maybe there's not enough bees in this queen bank, or maybe um, maybe there's too many queen cages in this queen bank. Uh, you, you, maybe you need to make up a separate queen bank to take care of these, because if you don't. Uh, you know, there's a really good chance that the other queens are basically going to die because they're being ignored, you know, and, and why are they ignoring them? You know, who knows? Maybe they're not as well mated. Maybe it's because of the location of the the, the cages in the queen bank. Uh, a lot of reasons, but if you don't do anything about this right away, I mean, some of these queens might already be dead. You can see a few of them at, uh, hanging out at the bottom of the cage, and maybe they're like at the, you know, they're already dead. It's hard to say, but so... Just be aware, you know, queen banking is not ideal, but it is sometimes necessary. So so just try to do it well and, and try to do it, you know, the minimum amount of time that you need to do it. Okay, let's talk about drones. I, I have to say, I don't know how many times, you know, I'm at a bee club meeting and there's, you know, hobbyists or backyard beekeepers and they say, somebody says something like, oh, those drones, those lazy drones, it's good for nothing bums or something along that line. And I have to say, I always speak up and I always get a bit irritated. I mean, it would be like, 
you know, saying that, you know, to a cattle rancher, you know, his prize bull that he may has spent many thousands and thousands of dollars on, oh, that lazy bull, he doesn't do anything. You know, he's just out there and does only one thing on his mind. Well, uh, you know, that bull is half the herd, as the old saying goes, and the same thing with the drones. They're a very important part of your breeding program, uh, whether you think about them or not. So drones, just to review a little basics about drone behavior and breeding, that usually a queen mates with 12 to 14 drones, sometimes many more than that. And most drones never win the lottery of mating. They never mate. And many are either eaten or get lost or die. And eventually at the end of the year, they're kicked out of the hive, as we all know. And less than 1% of them ever mate. And you should, But you should raise many more drones than you will think you need. Um, and drones are often the forgotten part about honeybee breeding programs. You want to make sure the drones that you have are of the proper age to mate with your queens. This is especially important at the ends of the year. So early on in the spring, before they start laying many drones, if you don't have a lot of drones out there to mate with your virgin queens, you might have poorly mated queens. And then at the end of the summer, you know, if there's a dearth or a drought, the bees stop raising many drones. And that can also be a problem if you're planning on mating queens. Uh, keep in mind that drones take longer to, uh, to develop than do virgin queen bees. So you'll need to be encouraging your colonies to produce drones you know a few weeks prior to you when you begin grafting or raising queens you know as the saying goes with cattle there you know the the bull is the half the herd of a breeding program so same thing the drones are half the genetics of your breeding program so i try to choose the mother colonies for my drones as carefully as i would the mother colonies for my queens uh, in order to encourage them to raise drones, you want them to be strong with lots of nurse bees, healthy, low mite counts, mite damage uh, drones, uh, maybe even more so because they like to go into the drone comb. So if you have mite damaged drones, they will have problems and not have produce as much semen, not develop properly. Uh, you want them to have the characteristics you are breeding for, not closely related to your queen mother colonies, obviously, to prevent inbreeding uh, problems. And then feed them pollen and, uh, you know, and also if syrup if needed, if nothing is coming in. Uh, you know, try to treat them the same as you would a cell builder in order to encourage them to keep the drones uh, present. So something that was... Uh, published with uh, Dr. Larry Connor was drone holding colonies. So if you try to produce drones in a single colony, if you're not raising a lot of queens, you can just let the colonies you want produce the drones that you want, and it's not a big deal. Indeed, if you're just a, a, a small-time hobbyist backyard or small sideline beekeeper, there, if there's a lot of bee colonies around, you know, and uh, then you might just have enough, you know, drones in your area to mate with your queens. Of course, you're not really going to be having any selection of the drones if you're just letting nature take its course and if you're in a place where there's Africanized bees that's going to be a big issue because your colonies will get Africanized but if you're going to try to produce your own drones you can use some of those green uh, drone comb foundation uh, and put them into the drone mother colonies a few weeks before grafting and then once you see purple eye drones as is pictured here you know that it is time to graft but because colonies will only produce one to three chrome combs of br drone brood at a time you might instead pull out the capped brood of the dr of the drone comb, pull it out, put it into another colony, which we call a drone, hol a drone, drone holding colony, so that they can emerge and the drone mother colonies can begin raising more drones by putting in another comb of the drone brood. So to try to raise more drones from your selected lines, I, what I do is I put the capped brood into queenless colonies or you could use a colony with a caged virgin which helps uh, encourage the bees to care for uh, the drones. I imagine them the same as a cell builder. Lots of young nurse bees, lots of resources. Make sure they have low mite counts going into the uh, uh, into this. I make up drone holding colonies about every two weeks during the season with about two to three combs of capped drone brood alternating with three to four combs of emerging worker brood but ideally not any uh, eggs or cells because they will start raising a queen and you know, which is not the end of the world and you'll have a new colony there at, at some point. I put the drone brood uh, into this colony separated by capped worker brood and if you have extra virgins you put her in a cage uh, and that helps them care for these uh, drones that are going to emerge and make sure to feed them with syrup and also protein is important. 
remove queen cells. And once all the brood has emerged within 24 days, because there's no laying queen, there's not going to be any new capped brood. And you can actually treat with a single dose of oxalic acid, um, whether it's syrup or what I do is the vaporization. After four weeks, you know, you can remove the, the virgin queen and, you know, she's no longer going to be able to be uh, naturally mated. So, you know, that, that she's like not going to be able to be used for anything. I guess if you're learning instrumental insemination, you could use her to practice uh, instrumental insemination if you're learning how to do that. But usually what I do is I remove her and then I would put a mated queen in there. And now this colony that was formerly a drone holding colony uh, is a new increase colony. Uh, uh, and so you can just use them, uh, you know, to, as an increase or to unite later on with a weak colony. So Dr. Connor in, in his publications recommends four to eight square inches of cap ready to emerge drone brood per queen. Um, you might need to double this in situations where there's unwanted genetics, a lot of other hives around. Uh, so one fully capped deep chrome of drone brood might mate only 50 to 80 queens. And in real life, the number numbers of viable drones will be produced will be less. Not every drone that emerges actually matures and is able to go mating. I try to make things a little bit more simple than this, than paying too much attention to to uh, square inches. What I try to do is I try to have a minimum of 10 to 12 drone mother colonies per queen mother, and I make sure they're not closely related. Again, I'm trying to ha have a, a, or try to avoid inbreeding that can happen if they're too closely related. That's a problem. And then the other thing is I put these drone holding colonies maybe a mile or so out from where my mating yard is. And that way, when my virgin queens fly up into the air and try to find the drone congregation areas, you know, they can go in any direction and they're going to run into a, a DCA that hopefully I've kind of stacked my cards genetically by having as many uh, of my drones that in there as possible. And sure, there's going to be other random stray drones from other colonies and feral colonies, but uh, hopefully I'm going to be stacking the cards so they're going to get as much of the genetics from my colonies as I, as I've, uh, as I want. Drone health is important too. Uh, you know, if you start seeing dead drone pupae or drone outside of these drone holding colonies, or even just full strength colonies, you know, that's a problem. And you need, maybe it, usually the most common problem is either lack of uh, incoming pollen, like a dearth. Uh, you know, the bees don't just kick the drones out or remove drone brood at the end of the season in the fall, but even when there's a drought. And then of course, mites can be very hard on drones as well. So you need to be, uh, you need to be monitoring that. And then something else that I didn't know about and I did, was not aware of until I began doing instrumental insemination, but you know, just because you have drones there in your colony, if they are not healthy and they don't have semen, you might have problems with you know suboptimal mating despite having drones present. And so what I do is I pull drones off of the entrance of my drone holding colonies. Uh, I put a queen excluder in front because the drones can't go through that. And then I evert the endophallus. Uh, it's easier to do if you're not trying to take a video of it as I'm doing in this photo. And then I take a look at that to see how much semen is present. This one here doesn't didn't have enough semen. It wasn't a good uh, close-up, but this one actually did not have really any semen. So if this drone was out flying to mate, uh, he wouldn't have been able to do anything, you know, genetically wise to that virgin queen. And here's a close-up of what the endo phallus looks like and that this has a bunch of semen on it and and this one if i was going to collect semen for instrumental insemination this would be a you know, perfect one to collect semen from but even if you're not doing insemination of queen bees doing this to your drones from your drone colonies occasional will tell you uh you know if these drones not only are they present but are do they have enough semen for mating the usual problem i find is the the colony is underfed and this seems to be more of a problem late in the summer when we're dirt, there's not as much pollen coming in. And so if I see a lot of the drones are not having a lot of semen, I just make sure these colonies are being fed with protein supplement to try to, to minimize that. Let's talk about issues with queen rearing, troubleshooting and possible solutions. I find a lot of the books and the online resources really don't speak much of this. They, they, they talk more about the how-to, you know, how to graft queens, how to make up mating nukes, but they don't really talk about when things go wrong. And so over the years, I've, I've made a whole bunch of mistakes, and sometimes I've repeated them a few times before I really understood what was happening. 
there's times when you're out there and, and something goes goes wrong and you're scratching your head. You know, what did I do wrong? You know, what, what happened and how can I do this better? Some of the issues we see with queen rearing include the following. Uh, poor acceptance of grafts. So, you know, you were very careful to try to do your, you know, graft your queen cells, but then you come back and, you know, there's hardly any of them that have been accepted. Um, the cells are accepted, but they're tiny. Uh, they're accepted and capped, but then later on they're torn down. Uh, poor emergence of your ripe queen cells. Or your queen cells emerge, the virgin queens disappear before they begin laying eggs. You know, and what happened with that? The causes of all of these problems, you know, it, the answer to most of these things are it depends. You know, there's many causes of these kinds of problems. But when we're talking about poor acceptance of grafts, I start thinking about how were the grafts handled? You know, uh, were they uh, when you were and this is when you're like getting the the larva from the from the cell grafting over into a queen cell. You know, did it dry out? You know, what happened? You know, how old were the larvae when they were grafted? You know, was there enough bees? And some of the solutions you might consider if you have poor acceptance of the cells that you're grafting is take precautions to keep the larva from drying out. You know, keep out of the wind. The ones that you already grafted cover with a moist cloth. Try to avoid accidentally flipping the larva over when grafting. If I'm not sure, I just scoop that larva out and start over. Really try to make an effort to learn how to graft the smallest larva possible. The largest larva, larger larva might develop in the queens, but the queens might be suboptimal. And then make sure there's enough nurse bees. And when in doubt, put in more. You really want it, your, your cell builders, your cell starters to be overflowing with nurse bees. Other reasons for or questions to consider with poor acceptance of grafts. You know, are there queen cells on the comb? Is there a queen in the cell starter? You know, do they have enough food, enough resources? So solutions, make sure that all combs, uh, you check every single part for queen cells. And this might also be true after you know after you go back to check your grafts you know 24 40 hours to see if they were accepted also look for any volunteer queen cells on the combs make sure there's no queens that you accidentally shook into the cell starter uh, and when in doubt feed syrup and, and protein another problem is the queen cells are accepted but the cells are too small and i see pictures of this on the internet you know somebody just learned how to graft queens are really proud of them but they're little teeny weeny cells and you know that's not the best because a small queen cell usually produces a smaller queen you know she might be mated and fertile but she is not likely to have the productive life as a larger queen who has larger uh, ovaries and can lay for much longer and some of the questions you know where there are other queen cells and not enough nurse bees insufficient resources and again the possible solutions are, are more of the same that we might also do to try to encourage cell acceptance Queen cells are capped and accepted, but then they're destroyed. Uh, obviously, if there's a queen in the cell builder, maybe one flew in from outside, or you had a cell that was on one of the combs and you didn't happen to notice and the virgin emerged, you know, that'll be a problem. Um, and then are there enough incoming resources? You know, to, to try to avoid a queen flying in, you know, maybe a virgin just mated and she doesn't want to go back to her little dinky mating nuke and she goes into your cell builder she'll destroy them but also make sure there's no queens or queen cells uh, but later in the season you know if there's a dearth or a drought the workers sometimes will realize you know this is not the swarming season sure we're queenless but we don't need to raise you know these 20 or 40 or more queen cells we only need a couple of them so let's let's just tear these down and and so that's why just when in doubt feed and later in the season uh you know try i, I often will use a queenless cell starter and queenless cell finisher because if you're trying to do it by the queen right method you know a lot of times they'll be like well we're not going to swarm this time of year so they'll, they'll just only you know and i've had this happen so many times almost every year this happens at least once or twice where i go back and you know there was you know a few dozen queen cells that were accepted and i go back and there's like you know five or six that are left because the workers decided yeah we only need a few so that's that's what to do and the other thing too is you can take these out and put them into a a, a queen cell incubator uh, before the bees have a chance to pull them down. Poor emergence of ripe queen cells. You know, how were they handled? If they were handled roughly or they were allowed to get too cold? Um, black queen cell virus is out there. 
So whenever you have queen cells that were capped and ripened and look good, always go back and dissect them and look to see, because if you have that, that's a problem, and it's important to get rid of those lines of, of queens. Solutions, handle queens gently. Try not to move them until nine days after grafting, or if you have to, be very, very gentle. Uh, keep them warm when transporting, and then dissect uh, those queen cells for black queen cell virus, which is passed genetically, vertically from the mother. So if you have a line of, of uh, queens coming from a certain queen mothers, you might want to not you know raise from those anymore. And you might consider candling of cells. I know a lot of folks do this, and if if not all of the you know not all queen cells that are capped are viable, and so if they're not. You know, it's not worth your time to put them into a mating nuke. And if you're selling queen cells to a customer, obviously that would be bad to, to sell them a non-viable cell. And so candling can help basically same way as candling a chicken egg. You hold them up to a very bright light and you can see. And if it's shortly before emergence, sometimes you can even see the, the, the pupa wiggling around uh, in, the, in the cell, uh, which is kind of neat to see. Well, let's play. See, say you place the queen cells into the nukes, and uh, but the, then you come back and there's just no queen. They, you know, they disappeared, and you might even see the queen cells that they had emerged. You know, so you know that that it was a viable ripe queen cell, and you know it emerged. But then you come back and there's no queen there, and so you know you might think about the arrangement of the mating yard. You know, if you have long lines of of mating nukes, or if they're out in an open field, it may be difficult for that virgin queen to find her way back to her nuke after she has mated. And then the other issue is I've I've had uh, a queen uh, tried to make queens in open fields and meadows, and you know a lot of them were being lost. I look and I see swallows flying by and dragonflies, and uh, you know they're eating the larger, slower bees, which are the the drones and the and the virgins frequently. So that can be a problem also. So if you're having problems with queen cells emerging, but the some somehow the virgin queens disappear and the nukes are empty uh, here are some pro some possible solutions try to arrange your mating nukes so they face in different directions you might use color or landmarks such as brush or trees try to avoid long lines of nukes that might be easy for you to work but it might be harder for the queens to find their way back they might drift or go back to the wrong nuke and then if you're having problems with uh, dragonflies or birds move them to another location I know queen producers had some problems when they located their mating yard near some ponds or swampland where there were plenty of dragonflies coming over to, you know, have a buffet of your of your virgin queen bees, uh, and that wasn't very good. Myself, we live up in a ponderosa pine forest, which is an open forest. It's not a deep, dark forest. So I put my mating yard in the trees, and, you know, there's plenty of light, and the, they, the bees have no trouble coming and going, but the birds and dragonflies tend to stay above. They don't like flying amongst the trees. So by the time the queens are up and flying, going off to find the DCAs, they've, they've dispersed and spread out, and they're moving fast enough, it's harder for the birds and dragonflies to get them. That brings us to the end of this presentation in our series, The Mating Yard and Beyond. Many programs teaching how to raise queens forget that Grafting and producing queen cells is only one part of a successful queen bee breeding program. Sure, you do need to learn how to produce queen cells, whatever method you choose, but then you have to have some, you know, you have to have somewhere to put them. And there's several options, you know, for mating nukes. Uh, try different ones if you're not sure and uh, decide which works best for you. Try to avoid banking queens if you can. I, I have to do it occasionally too, and I, I try to do it for as short a time as possible. And don't forget, drones are the other half of your breeding program, so take care to raise plenty of them from the queens that have the genetics that you want. And then finally, if you have issues with queen production, troubleshoot. Try to figure out what the underlying problem is. It might be different each time, but if you can learn from your mistakes and troubleshoot, you can minimize having problems in the future. Our next presentation will delve deep into how to design a honeybee pro breeding program. These pr early initial presentations talk to you how to raise the queens themselves, but the next presentation in the series will talk about how to select for and breed for the characteristics that you would like. I hope you enjoy this series, and I hope it's helping you raise the best queens possible. Thank you again for watching.